welcome to The Bullpen, a video series where we talk about all things personal finance. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Jan Langbein of Genesis Women's Shelter and Support. Jan, we are so pleased to have I'm you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. So Jan, before we jump into today's topic, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit more about you, your background, and how you got involved with Genesis. Well, I'm not that interesting, but I think the way I ended up working at Genesis sort of is. I was actually in an organization that promotes volunteerism, and so I had signed up the year before for something I ended up not liking at all, and I thought I would go through the brochure and figure out what's the easy way out. Um, and I thought I had found it, and so I'm in a rush to sign up for that. Um, I had broken one of my wonderful community acrylic fingernails, and I thought, I can do, I want to do good in the community, but I think, you know, our nails ought to look nice. So I, I whip into this salon, and a magazine floats in my lap, and it says, every nine seconds in this country a woman is, a, is battered. And I thought, well, nobody I know and nobody that, who lives near me. And it said, you know, kind of on the front of this cover, one out, uh, 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 one out of every three women you pass will know domestic violence on an ongoing basis. It's the leading cause of injury to women in the United States. And I am looking at this like, you've got to be kidding me. I open the magazine. I read the article about a woman. Um, I believe she was a CPA and he was a, a dentist or vice versa. And um, he beat her because dinner was late. Well, long story short, a little bit longer, I did get my nail fixed, but mm -hmm. by the time I got to where headquarters to sign up for this new volunteer placement, I opened the brochure, I put my finger on Genesis Women's Shelter. I'd never even heard of it, and, but that's where my finger went, and so that's where I went. And when I got there, I thought, you know, they're going to look differently than I do, and they didn't. Their children looked like mine. My, you know, I, I, it's so easy for any of us to think that this can't impact my life when we know that. I refer to it as an equal opportunity epidemic. <laughs> so here I am 32 years later. They hired me. They kept me on. Uh, I went from the Tuesday morning volunteer to the CEO of this organization. And it was small back then. It was really small. We had a small budget. We had small offices. Um, but just as you kind of watch and listen, and I, they shouldn't have hired me at all. I'd never read a financial statement. I had never hired or fired. But yeah. you put one foot in front of the other and you say, you know what? I'm here to make a difference. And get out of my way, right? Yeah. Please follow or get out of my way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's how I got there, and I would look and see, gosh, how can she go to court if she doesn't have child care? We'd put child care on site, or her children are being snatched out of school or daycare, so we put school, we put uh, school on site. Uh, lack of access to civil legal representation can actually be the biggest roadblock, mm -hmm. and so we put um, a legal clinic on site. Uh, so, you know, I say that in 30 seconds, it took me 30 years, but here I am, <laughs> still plugging away. That's fantastic. Uh, such a true, kind of genuine story of how you fall in love with something right. as you're introduced to it. Right. I love that. Right. Very mission-oriented. So, um, I think it would be great for our listeners and members to hear from you some examples of financial abuse because I think we hear a lot about domestic abuse right. and we go to the worst case scenario that right. we've seen on TV, which those definitely have their place in the conversation, of course. Sure. But for our listeners, I think financial abuse is something that's not often talked about. So I'd love to know some examples from you of kind of what that looks like. Right. The studies say that 97% of people do not recognize financial abuse as domestic violence, when in fact it is a very powerful, in fact it's more effective than a lock and a key. Uh, when we start thinking about the kinds of compensatory power that he has mm -hmm. over her, the house is in his name, the cars are in his name, the stock portfolio is in his name, uh, the house in Aspen is in his name. Whatever the assets are, it, it is controlling. Uh, it is being controlled by the perpetrator. And again, maybe I have been stuffing away money my mom sent me in the bottom of a sugar bowl. Well, he's found that and that's gone. When people ask me, I swear, when people ask me, why don't she just get out? <laughs> Without money, where are you going tonight? If you don't have a credit card, because he ruined your credit and he's cut that card up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have any cash, and I don't know that hotels even take cash anymore, um, but where am I going to sleep tonight? And so you stay one more day and you try a little bit harder and you cry a little bit less. Uh, but the financial compensatory power that an abuser has over um, his, his victim 
is tremendously impactful. Um, it, it, people usually don't think that that is a choice of weapon, but it most certainly is. Absolutely. I remember when we were talking prior to this, you sharing a story about a woman uh, in her 70s, and she had been married for such a long time and finally got the courage to yeah. break free, realizing that there was so much financial abuse and even had grown adult children right. that didn't realize the magnitude. Right. Right. Um, and I can only imagine at that age, yes. after having endured it for so long, even your just understanding of money and finance yeah. probably is so jaded. I uh, think about her so often. I really do. Uh, retired couple. She, you know, however you divvy stuff up, she actually paid the bills. And so, uh, but he was very physically abusive with her. Mm -hmm. And then she, um, the day she came into Genesis, I was talking with her. She was very scared, very mm -hmm. scared. What, what is she going to do? Where is she going to go? What does Genesis look like? I want my home. You want to you go home, right? right. <laughs> and sleep in your bed. <laughs> um, but she, I, I talked to her that day that she came in, and she was in her, in her room. And he starts calling her, calling her, calling her. And she was terrified to pick it up, and she was terrified not to. So we, I just tried to get her mind off that phone. And I said, you know, uh, tomorrow you need to go to the bank and get some money out. And she said, oh, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. And I said, well, she goes, I don't want him to be with, still caretaking, I don't want him to be without funds. And I said, well, why don't you take half or figure out how much he's going to need for the house and the, you know, the gas in the car, and then you take some for yourself. And she thought, okay, I could do that. I could do that. She went to the bank the next day, and of course he beat her there and had completely drained the account, and she came back so dejected, I have nothing. I have nothing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That is really awful. Thank goodness she had some support yes. to fall back on. So can you give us, kind of talking, you mentioned the physical abuse. We've talked about financial abuse, obviously, but can you give us a good definition of domestic violence? Absolutely, and most people do think it's a black eye, it's a split lip. Domestic violence is all about power and control. It is not about a fight that got out of control. It is not about, it's one person uh, with deliberate actions in order to keep control over someone else. Mm -hmm. So if me yelling at somebody keeps control, maybe that's all that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, I'm yelling about everything, then maybe a, a push or a shove might punctuate sure. the relationship. Um, I'm used to pushing and shoving all the time, so I take away her money, and I take away her car, and I take away her phone. Uh, I, I systematically remove her from any support that she has. Um, so it, it, people think it is a fight that got out of control, but it is absolutely all about power control. And I often have people ask me, well, so why does he do it in the first place? Why does he want to have that kind of control? So um, what we know is that abusers tend to have three core beliefs. Now, a core belief is something that... Um, I, I can't, you won't change my mind no matter what you say. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you and I can talk politics. I think we were on the same page there before the <laughs> recording started. But um, we can talk about it, and I'll listen to your, your view, and you'd listen to my view. Sure. But there are core beliefs that I couldn't change your mind no matter what I said to you. Um, I believe in baby Jesus, and there's nothing you can say that would change my mind on that. Well, a core belief to an abusive person is that I can have what I want the way I want it, when I want it, mm -hmm. number one. Number two is, it's her responsibility to make it happen. And his third core belief, something from which you cannot talk him out of, is I can punish her if she doesn't make that happen. So it becomes this core belief. And if I'm going to get what I want, if I'm going to punish her, um, it's going to be in a way that hurts her most. What would be your hurt most? Mine would be, you hurt my children. Sure. Or you hurt my pets or you remove me from talking to my mom every day, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And so he knows her better than anybody, and he will hurt her in a way that hurts her the most, to gain and keep, maintain that power and control. My goodness. Uh, yeah, it, if you've spent time studying psychology, this is ringing the bell very much for narcissistic personality yes. disorder yes. Yes. Uh, all day long. And right. that, to me, is so scary because there is a lot of psychological control there is, going on. There is, but it's a choice. It's mm -hmm. not something that he has to do. And by the way, I use he as the perpetrator and she because in 90, uh, she is the survivor because in 95% of the battered population, the woman is the victim. Um, the severity is usually much worse. But there are men who are abused. There are men who are battered by women, by same gender partners. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority, however, of men 
who are killed by their partner are killed by another male partner, wow. uh, whereas women who are killed are killed primarily by male partners. But I think that that's a really good point to bring out in all of this is that Unfortunately, domestic abuse knows no bounds. Right. It knows no specifics. Uh, so we have to keep our eyes open right. everywhere we're looking. And I think it's um, good to know the statistics because you can probably have a better shot at, at pointing it out. Right. But of course, um, it's, it's unfortunately everywhere. So you were talking about the abuser. And I think I know the very obvious answer to this question, as I'm sure our members do. But do people wake up one day and just decide to be an abuser? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> I don't think they do. I, yeah. I don't think that, you know, it, it doesn't really work for them outside of that home. So they have learned to be kind people. So, all right, so some kids, some abusers learned it as a child. Mm -hmm. Boys raised in a home almost always continue with that generational cycle of violence, right? Girls raised in a violent home almost always seek out a guy like dear old dad. Mm -hmm. So there is a little, it's not predestined, but there is a, a, a piece of learned behavior, right? And then depending on how it works for that person out in the world, uh, let's take somebody who's very affluent and, I don't know, owns a sports team or something that people, or a political figure that people just fall all over themselves sure. over, right? Kind of a cult leader, if I can use that term these days. Um, it's working for him to be this narcissistic, I'm in control, you know, you do what I say or you'll be sorry kind of thing. Um, so it's reinforced. Mm -hmm. It's reinforced by society. It's reinforced by the legal system when he, you know, gets arrested for hitting her and then he gets off. Um, when it's, uh, you know, reinforced by his buddies when they're having beers and they're laughing about the old ball and chain. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much in society that reinforces this behavior. We live in a society that eroticizes violence, to be real honest. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's not predetermined. Um, it can be learned at home, but there are a lot of guys who didn't grow up in a violent home that, you know, uh, are violent. Mm -hmm. And so it is, yeah, it is learned and it is perpetuated. Mm -hmm. I would agree wholeheartedly. So I know you mentioned some examples there, but are there other red flags that we can be looking for? Red flags regarding? Uh, abusers, uh, financial abusers, domestic violence. Absolutely, absolutely. And none of us, if you went out to dinner with a guy and he was immediately abusive, you'd never go out to dinner with that guy <laughs> again. Course. So they get really, really good at sneaking up on us, right? They come on like, oh, my knight in shining armor, and he's so wonderful, and he knows how to sweep me off my feet. And so uh, some of the red flags are, uh, a relationship that happens too fast, mm -hmm. not allowing you to get to know each other, or a relationship where he makes all the decisions, where you're going to go to dinner, what you're going to do, um, what you, oh, you're wearing the black shirt, I really, you know, I pre you do what you want, but I really prefer you in red. Mm -hmm. um, little by little, and it can be very subtle, and you're like, oh, well, he likes me in red, he likes my hair down, I'll wear my hair down and I'll wear red. Um, but then you look up and he's making all the decisions, mm -hmm. um, and then it, even the, uh, Financial abuse can start off like, you know, honey, you don't have to work. I want to take good care of you. Um, and in fact, I'm going to pay all the bills. Go out and shop till you drop, but I'm going to need you to bring home all the receipts. And so, you know, that sounds good to me. Go shop till you drop. Okay, <laughs> right. I could do that. But all of a sudden, you know, he'll check those receipts. One air, one Hermes scarf, check. One, you know, new purse, check. Uh, you're a dollar fifty short. Where is that dollar fifty? Oh. Well, I, I stopped at 7-Eleven to get a soda. I ask you to bring on all the receipts. Now, if you can't do that for me, and that's how it starts. It wow. starts gradually. I'm doing you a favor. I'm taking good care of you. But you know what? If you don't, if you don't uh, get it right, mm -hmm. then you will pay the price. Um, there's also, when you think of financial abuse, we were talking about the different examples of it. Um, and one is just being afraid to ask your partner about finances. Like, I don't want to pay the bills at my house. Great, my husband does it. But I can also say how much is in the bank account, right? Sure. And it's not a, it's not a, um, a thing. Whereas women who are being abused financially, one of the things is they have no say about how the money is spent or earned or invested. Uh, even if she's employed, that paycheck probably goes into his bank account. Mm -hmm. And even if she asked about it, um, it, it's not her business at all. It's not her business at all, I know, right? I was um, uh, speaking at a wealth management group here mm -hmm. in Dallas one time, and 
I w they were saying, you know, I don't see what those red flags are. And I said, well, let me ask you this. If you ever have a client come in and the wife is there and he's just like, sign this, sign this, sign this. And she's like, okay, I don't know what that is anyway. You know, and she's signing away. That is financial abuse. If she is afraid to say, what is it I'm signing, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it can be so subtle and it can be um, so obvious, uh, but it can be very, very uh, impactful. Absolutely. I'm thinking of, you know, you talk about the stigmas and thing like, things like that in our society. I'm thinking about as a little girl watching Cinderella and, you know, you have this Prince Charming comes and right. takes me away. Right. And so I can see where you can trick yourself yeah. into believing that those are genuine acts when in reality they're controlled. And, you know, I try to tell women, protect yourself physically and emotionally and protect yourself financially. I heard a police officer one time give an analogy of um, if, if someone wants to break into your home, that they can do it uh, if you have enough time and you have enough tools and you have whatever. But if, if uh, uh, someone who wants to break into my home comes to my back door, there he can see a security sticker. He can see the two deadbolt locks. He can see the German Shepherd in my kitchen floor, right? Mm -hmm. So he probably is going to go next door to where there is no German Shepherd. There are no locks and where it's, it's easier to invade, if that makes sense. So abusers get really good at figuring women on who's going to be who, who's easily invaded, if that, mm -hmm. does that make sense? It makes total so sense. So I encourage yeah. women, particularly for financially, to have your own money, have, an own, have your own bank account, be able to understand how your, your funds, even if you don't have separate accounts, are being invested. Be a part of those decisions. Um, you know, you don't want to wake up when you're 75 and you've never paid a bill in your life and, mm -hmm. you know, not by financial control, but just your spouse dies or something right. and you just, you just don't know how to handle money. Or, or you want to know because you may, it may save your life someday. Right. Well, it's funny. We were talking about the passing of my father right. earlier today when you first arrived. And that was a very real situation for my mom. And there was no financial abuse. My dad was a wonderful person. But uh, my mom just had never been the one to actually pay right. the bill. She may have known what was going on and right. what the status of the accounts are. But she didn't know how to do those things. And so yeah. it was a big eye-opening experience yeah. for her yeah. once he passed. So uh, it's important regardless of the circumstances, but most especially if you're in um, a sticky situation right. with financial abuse, right, of right. course. So in your career, spanning the 32 years you mentioned earlier and fighting for women in the area, are there some top misconceptions that we should know about when it comes to domestic violence Absolutely. and financial abuse? Absolutely. Well, whatever kind of abuse it is, I think it's very, it's much easier for us to think that it happens to somebody else and that somebody else doesn't look like me, that it doesn't happen to affluent women or, or households. Um, or people who are documented, or people who are, that maybe an abuser, you know, looks like a, a thief in the night. But man, they can wear preacher's robes, they can wear suit, three-piece suits, they can wear doctor's lab coats, uh, just as survivors can wear doctor's lab coats, or be mm -hmm. a lawyer, or a mm -hmm. dentist, or an accountant. Um, so I think we imagine what it might look like, or what it might be like. Um, and another huge myth is that if she didn't like it, she'd probably get out. Right? If it was really that bad, she would, she would leave. And there are hundreds of reasons, I swear, hundreds of reasons that women stay in a violent home. And right at the top of that list is financial abuse. Almost 100% of the women who come to Genesis have experienced financial abuse. And it, it, it looks in all kinds of different things, but with that at the top of the list, it really, it really is tough. Um, and again, I, I'm asked that question every day, why doesn't she just get out? And um, it's, it's a lot easier to ask than it is to do, so. 100%, I'm thinking of, you know, certain situations I've heard of where the victim is a very established person, mm -hmm. a very intelligent person, and we find out that they've been the victim yeah. this entire time, and you go, well, you're so smart, how, how did you not you're so know? You're so smart, exactly. Yeah. You're so smart, or you're so capable, or you seem so strong. You're... As if victims are dumb. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I had a guy one time call and say, uh, tell me about Genesis, and I was like, great, great, great. And he goes, you know, at the end of the conversation, he says, I'd like to make a, a donation. I'm like, I love this, right? I lo and then he says, well, it's not money. And I'm like, oh, disappointed, but mm -hmm. we take a lot of in-kind donations. And he said, it's food. And I'm like, okay, great. We cook with it. We get food boxes away. Sure. And he said, it's a pallet of spam. I and I'm like, wait, what? 
he said, do battered women like spam? And I'm like, mister, I don't even know what spam is. I mean, I know it's in a can, mm -hmm. but when I calm myself back down again, I thought, do you think because I'm battered I'll eat anything? Or those women who eat spam end up being abused? I mean, and in other words, he had no concept or no understanding of what the dynamics are. Right. And um, so actually I got to do a TED Talk one time called Do Battered Women Eat Spam? That's going to be maybe the title of my next book, or my first that. book, actually, yeah. I love yeah. that. I love yeah. that. Well, speaking of TED Talks and books, um, I think that there these misconceptions translate to what we see in the media. Right. And, you know, right now they've just released, um, I believe on Max, uh, a docuseries called House of Hammer, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the Armand Hammer family mm -hmm. and most specifically the actor Army Hammer. Right. Uh, we also have Tina Turner who just recently right. passed and everything that's kind of come back around with she and Ike Turner. Right. I'm curious your opinion on if you think the media helps or hurts those conversations and how people in the public eye who are experiencing these things, um, how we can learn from them. Right, right. No, I think it does. I think it, good or bad, it raises the awareness. This, this has historically been a behind the closed doors kind of thing, or don't bother me, or I'm not going to get involved in that, that's a private matter. And so when something comes out, like Big Little Lies, for example, yes. the way Nicole Kidman played the part of an abused woman was brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, the bruises didn't show, uh, the, the psychological, the emotional uh, abuse that he had. Um, you know, I even think there was financial abuse in mm -hmm. that. She barely scraped money by, together to get this apartment and then that was ruined. Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, I think when people are talking about it, have you seen the, the series, Netflix series, Made, M-A-I-D? Uh, yes. 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 So again, that gave, gave people, you know, he, he would put his fist through the wall, and, but, but when you see her move out into the country, he takes her phone away, mm -hmm. the car that was gifted to her is now, he took it back, and you see her sinking into that sofa. And that's exactly what these moms experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, social services wouldn't help her. She cleaned all day, but then she had to pay for the chemicals. And the, where's her child going to be? And, you know, at some point you just think, I can't do this, right? I can't do this. So the, to answer your question, yes, I think it's good. When people, and it shouldn't be, but people come out like the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And it's movie stars saying this, not the original woman that, that brought up the concept of it. But when movie stars come out and say, yes, he did this to me too, um, then, um, you know, even if you look at sexual assault cases in the news recently, was she an adult film actress versus, you know, was she a uh, journalist mm -hmm. and how that was treated differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it does help. Um, I think it just raises awareness and it starts conversations like this Absolutely. that we need to be having. Absolutely. I agree. I think sometimes things get a little twisted uh, with different PR efforts and, you know, in the days of social media, you can paint a completely different picture of yourself than right. who you are. Right. And so um, I think probably because of those things, it allows people to maybe be forced to make a decision, do I believe this or do I not? But right. at least it has them thinking. Right. And more than anything, maybe investigating a little bit more what those red flags are or what those examples are that right. would have um, gotten those folks into that situation. And when high profile people step up and say, that was me too. Mm -hmm. um, Viola Davis is an outstanding actress and I'd heard her speak in Dallas several times or, or around and um, you know, she was nice to listen to in her TV experience and her film experience. But when she's just recently written this book, and now she's talking about the abuse that was in her family of origin, mm -hmm. um, it steps forward and it helps other people. It normalizes, okay, if she can talk about it, you know what, I can, I can talk about it too. Because until we do, until we scratch off that scab, and, or that pull off that Band-Aid, that, that festers for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Even if we're out of the abuse, it just festers for the rest of our lives unless we let it go. Well, and what an example she sets for some of the victims that come to see you guys. Correct. Of, Correct. She's such a successful, amazing person that gives back. Mm -hmm. So I, too, can talk about it. I, too, can become like right. her. Right, That's empowering. That's because really empowering. the isolation uh, within domestic violence, the isolation is a huge factor. Mm -hmm. Whether it's physical, I'm moving you out of town. 
uh, or it is emotional isolation. Why are you talking to your mom? You, your sister shouldn't be coming over here every day. You know, it's, it's more trouble than it's worth to have these relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so to hear, that's why we do a lot of group work at Genesis. Uh, when you hear across the room what that abuser did, I'm like, I thought it was just me. And I thought it was my fault. And I thought I, 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 there was something I did wrong. Um, and so you hear somebody else say it, and it really is powerful. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, that's incredible. <clears throat> so what are some questions um, that we're not asking as a society? Obviously, it's easy to ask, you know, some of the obvious red flag questions or mm -hmm. even things that we've discussed so mm -hmm. far. But what are we not asking? Well, I think one big one is how can I help? You know, we can't leave this issue on the doorsteps of Genesis Women's Shelter and Support. We can't leave it on the doorsteps of the Dallas Police Department or, you know, the prosecutor's office uh, or City Hall. Uh, we all have to be willing to roll up our sleeves and say, you know, are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, as women in this room, as, as human beings, we ought to be able to say, are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help you? Um, that doesn't mean jump into a, a, a fight right in the middle, although I have been known to get awfully close to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, to be able to reach out. Now, whether that is directly to a person or volunteer at your local domestic violence program mm -hmm. or pull out that credit card and preferably Genesis Women's Shelter and support. <laughs> but, you know, make a difference. Let your voice be heard. Let your voice be heard politically. You know, uh, here in Texas, we had the uh, Fifth Circuit ruling recently talking about uh, firearms and uh, the federal ruling that somebody subject to a protective order could no longer have firearms. Well, that was reversed about, um, I don't know, six months ago, within the last six months, which means a criminal who has been convicted or has a uh, protective order, is subject to a protective order, mm -hmm. let's give him his guns back. And the presence of a firearm in an abusive home um, just ratchets up the chance like 500 times that she will be murdered murdered in that home. But now this one Fifth Circuit ruling impacts Texas and I think Mississippi and Louisiana. And so that's a step back. So the question that really needs to be asked is how can I be a part of this? Sure. How can I make my, my community safer? How can I make my mom safer or my sister or my granddaughter safer? It's we're talking about it. We're doing what we can with what we have. That's all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Do what you can with what you have. I, I love that. I think just in my own circle of women uh -huh. in Atlanta, um, all in various different stages of life, just being able to have a question to say, how are you doing? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I think a lot of times these folks, you know, yes, maybe they've been isolated, but they have people in their network. Right. But it's this fear of crossing over and right. admitting this. Correct. It's um, maybe not feeling like you have a safe space to right. do so. Right. And I've heard time and time again feeling as though um, if I were to say this negative thing, say about my husband, right. then what will people think about think my husband? Absolutely. What will they think about absolutely. me if yeah. I stay? Yeah. Um, and all those kind of emotional barriers end up getting in the way of so really happening. let's think of a different way of saying that. Let's say you are concerned about one of your friends and you're a little timid about just point blank asking. Well, say, oh my gosh, I was listening to that bullpen the other day and this crazy old white haired woman came in and was talking about how it's one out of every three. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope we could talk about it if it was you or me. If your friend had bulimia, if your friend had diabetes, wouldn't you step up and say something? No matter sure. how embarrassed she was about it or private about it, sure. because um, you, you have a bigger chance of losing your friend Bye. from domestic violence than from diabetes or bulimia. My goodness. I know. That's a, that's a wild perspective to right. have. Um, and you think about how publicized those uh, illnesses are right. in comparison. Because none of those illnesses you think are your fault. Mm -hmm. where you, there's something inside of us as women, as, you know, survivors of violence that we think, well, I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and if I, I just deserve this, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't deserve better, yeah. Oh, goodness. Um, so talking kind of about women and, and our inner circles, I know that this impacts men too. I remember yes. you telling me, uh, and you referenced it earlier, men being at the golf course or being around right. uh, the table having beers, something like that, and talking about the old ball and chain. Yeah. I remember you telling me an example of a man who said, you know what, I don't appreciate 
you saying that. Yes. It's trying to kind of destigmatize that. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what men can do, yes. especially, to yes. change this narrative. I'm telling you, it is so powerful when men speak up. Anybody who knows me knows I'm going to come in and just be talking, talking, talking about it. But when a man stands up and says, you know what, I'm not shaking your hand because I know how you treat your wife, mm -hmm. or I choose not to do a business deal with you, um, it, it is it is absolutely amazing. We have an auxiliary, a men's auxiliary called Heroes. It's, it stands for He Respects Others. And the motto is basically, I'm not going to do it in my house, but it's not okay with me if it's happening to you in your house. Mm -hmm. Zero tolerance. They have, it is unacceptable. Um, and these guys do everything from come down and serve dinner to our moms. They grill once a week during the warm weather. Uh, they are mentors to our little boys who are living there. They go to court and sit on the bride's side of the courtroom and let the elected official know that these are guys in suits and ties and professional men that care about this issue. And I tell you, the judge sits up straighter, the bailiff doesn't go to okay. sleep, and we get protective orders we never would have gotten before. Um, so the men can absolutely do something about this, and it's real hands-on. It, maybe you're not comfortable saying, I'm not going to do a business deal with you. But you know what? You don't have to laugh at his jokes. You don't have to. And I think maybe I had talked to you about um, in uh, pre-con on, on this thing, uh, preparation for our meeting today, that if you were, if the men were in a room and one of them, uh, one of the guys is laughing and he's just being kind of crude, but then he uses the N-word. Mm -hmm. I would hope someone in that group would say, you know what, I'm not comfortable you using that word. I'd, pre I'd prefer you not to use it. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Okay, how, can, how do we not say this, stand up for the women in our lives? Because she's somebody's daughter, she's mm -hmm. somebody's sister. So I think men can just have such an important role in this if they will just step up and unite. It's easier to unite. And if you can put a golf club in their hand or a bourbon, a glass of bourbon in their hand, they can, they will come around and they will be a very strong, powerful voice. They put trikes together for us and they do all kinds of things. Yeah, that's really really wonderful. And I'm assuming uh, the the healing process for women and for their children, having a male figure and seeing yes. it as a positive yes. male figure. It's probably expedited, Absolutely or at least uh, knowing that when you go to take this first step back out into the uh -huh, real world, uh -huh. that there are people. Gentlemen. Uh, there are gentlemen out there. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, but gentlemen. And it's amazing to watch a young child who has lived in a violent home. They're very good at saying, are you here to help me or are you here to hurt me? Because they constantly have to have uh, be on alert, right? Yeah. And they look at our heroes and they, they just, I want to be like you. Yeah. I want to be like you, whatever you look like. Um, we've seen that time and time again. Mm -hmm. Our founder uh, gave uh, was on the show with us uh, quite a bit ago, but he talks about when he was a child. Mm -hmm. um, his he, he it wasn't necessarily an abusive home, but it wasn't a healthy home. Right. And he talks about uh, when he went over to a friend's house and he saw a man in a suit and tie, and it was his dad. And the dad wanted to be involved, and it was just such a positive influence that he hadn't seen in right. such a long time. And that was really the driver for who he wanted to become as an adult. And he's a very successful, very giving, very smart individual. Um, and so, yeah, that, that influence plays such a major uh, role. Yeah, no, in, it really does. Lives. It really yeah. does. That's who I want to be when I grow up. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so what are some practical financial tips that we can give to individuals uh, in this situation or if they are supporting friends who might be in this situation? Well, uh, you know, I would suggest that you know what your finances are, that you keep track of them. And it's so easy for me not to pay attention because I just go to work all the time and I'm doing this, mm -hmm. I'm doing that, and let Steve do that. I, that's fine with me. Um, but I should know. I should know where we are. I should know how to pay bills. I should know um, to, and maybe it's, um, uh, it, would, it, would it make me feel more comfortable if I had a checking account that was just my, my running money, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or it's the money, my check goes in. It, you, it just has to be a partnership. Right. Those are the tips. How, whatever makes it a partnership in your relationship, then that's the right way to do it. But when it feels not like a partnership about the money, Maybe I spend my money and he spends his money. Maybe that's how some people do it. Or, you know, I spend mine and I spend his too, which is a, <laughs> when you work at a nonprofit, that's probably part of it too. Sure. Um, but I think knowing about your financial and then knowing what those red flags are and not falling for, oh, don't you worry about it, little lady, I, I'll handle all of this mm -hmm. for you. That should be very, very scary. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, somebody, uh, a friend of mine was on a, uh, she's a young adult and she was on a date and a guy um, said, he took her out for ice cream after a show or something and so they're eating ice cream and he says, uh, would you like a bite of mine? And um, she said, no, I'm fine, thank you very much. And he, she said, would you like a bite of mine? He says, well, I'm welcome to it seeing how I paid for it. I mean, you get up and you run. At the first sign, you get up and you run. That was the first date. And he felt like he could do whatever because he had bought her ice cream. I mean, it just, it blows me away. So I think we need to know what the signs are. We need to know what to say and how to say it to a friend. And by the way, how we respond to when a friend does tell us mm -hmm. can make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. If we are, oh my gosh, I'm shocked. He seems like such a nice guy. Well, he's not, and never mind anyway, right? Yeah. We have to be prepared. I hear you. I, 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 I'm here to help you. I mean, mm -hmm. I believe you. So an abuser will tell somebody, no one's going to hear you or help you or believe you, right? And at Genesis, we do all the above. We do hear her. And I, I keep talking about Genesis, but I know this goes more widely than just Dallas or Texas. And, sure. um, but there are uh, programs all over the country. There's a National Domestic Violence Hotline. All of us should know what that is. 1-800-799-SAFE. And they can refer out to a local program. We need to be part of this movement. We ought to call our preachers and say, I haven't heard a sermon out of the pulpit on this issue. And, you know, people in this faith community are experiencing this abuse. Mm -hmm. So I think we hold our doctors accountable, our lawyers, our elected officials for sure. Yeah. Let your voice as women, let our, let our voices and our votes be heard. Sure. Uh, because I think that can make a difference as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I know in terms of financial tips and, and things of that nature, um, we often talk about just start with a conversation with your partner mm -hmm. or whoever it is that you manage finances with. Sometimes it's with your elderly parents, sometimes right. it's with your children. That knows no bounds as well, but just start with a conversation and be open and willing to talk about mm -hmm. it. Um, and money, I think, carries a stigma, too. Uh, it's hard to tell people if you don't have money. It's right. hard to tell people that right. you need it and right. to ask for it. So even if you're going to a friend and saying, you know, I'm in trouble and right. I need help, right. it's right. hard even right. to ask them for yeah. help sometimes, yeah. especially as women. Yeah. So um, I would say just do it. Do it. Do, do it. it. If you find yes. yourself in that situation, just do it um, because it will likely end up better than you absolutely have absolutely. Uh, depicted in your head at least so. and I hope you're surprised by your friends if you mm -hmm. do ask for help I, I think I think we all need to step up and roll up our sleeves mm -hmm. no more are we not involved in this that's mm -hmm. your private business we are all involved in this mm -hmm. so if we're ever going to turn it around if we're ever going to create a societal paradigm shift we're all going to have to be talking about this absolutely my childhood best friend um, she says you know, and obviously she's kidding, but she says, you know, I'll have, I'll have the shovel, the rope, the bag, and a <laughs> bottle of wine in the trunk. You just call me. <laughs> I know, but, right? You know, I know That's that if I was, is. if I ever needed it, yes. no matter what it is, yes. all yes. I have to do is call and ask, and she opened that door for me. By just that saying can... that right up front, and so you know, you haven't forgotten that. Exactly. What, yeah. So whether it is abuse in your home or you got a diagnosis of breast cancer, she's going to be there yep. with that bottle of wine. So you got it. You got a good friend there. Yeah, she she is a wonderful person, definitely a keeper. Good. So, uh, in this episode of The Bullpen, we have been joined by Jan Langbein, CEO of Genesis, and National Advocate of Women's Rights and Domestic Violence. Where can our members find out more about you, Genesis, and any other resources that they Thank may have? Thank you for that. Our website is very easy, www.genesisshelter.org. Those two words run together, genesisshelter.org. But if you or someone you know needs help, our phone is answered 24 hours a day Fantastic. at 214-946-HELP. Um, and so, yeah, go on a website. We have auxiliaries to join, ways to get... Uh, involved, um, to make a donation, uh, but also there's a lot of good information on there about how to help a friend, what to say, uh, am I in an abusive relationship, what are the red signs, and also even an escape button that if you are on our website and it's not safe for you to be there, just hit escape and it, and it will erase it from the history. Wow. Yeah. What an interesting technology. That's very cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for oh, those resources. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. This was great. Great fun talking about this. You're, so you're much fun. Very good at this. <laughs> uh, thank you. So that does it for the episode, Jan. Uh, thank you for joining us.
My pleasure. And thank you all for listening. That does it for the bullpen.